just I just tried it. Um, I'm not going to show the presentation. I'll show for myself to all those that I haven't seen in a long time. Hello. Um, so, you know, we, we've been exhorting for a long time and, uh, you know, sometimes you end up running out of uh, topics or things to exhort on, not really running out, but, um, you know, some of the things you might end repeating them, but in a different, uh, from a different angle. So this exhortation uh, is prompted uh, by a friend who uh, asked a question. And I just thought maybe this applies to me as well. It might apply to a lot of other people. And uh, I think it would be ideal that maybe we I share one or two thoughts. So we meet every Sunday to remember Christ who was brutally killed in the presence of many people. Amongst them, it was his mother, Mary, and her friends and brothers and sisters who had become family by virtue of the bond they had with Christ. In Luke 23, verses 26 to 28, we read, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon of Syrian on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him to carry behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, including women, who kept mourning and wailing for him. This is Jesus now. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Uh, this is a strong statement in the sense that, I mean, this person who is going to be slaughtered, who's going to be killed, uh, is still in this state of mind, very rational. Usually this situation um, causes and calls for fear and panic. But we can see God's intervention prevailed. So the topic of this exhortation is dealing with loss. When we talk of loss, what usually comes into mind or top on the list is death. But there is loss of a lot of things. Um, you can lose your house. You can lose your car. Um, you can lose family because of uh, deciding to turn to Christianity. As an example to that, I also have someone I work with whose, fa whose family has disowned her um, last year because they were Muslims and she decided to turn to Christianity. So all these are different types of loss. So, but maybe the, the main one will be dead. And now we, if we look at my opening, I spoke of Jesus and the way that he responded even on the verge of being killed. If we go 
back to Luke 20, verses 41 to 45. Or if we read Luke 20, verses one, uh, 41 to 45, there is um, an element of human, which, is, which I want to um, convey, where Jesus was asked. And the reason why I'm reading this is because sometimes when you give comparison of Jesus Christ to uh, yourself and myself, uh, so it turns into a debate that uh, Jesus' situation was and is different to us. But now in Luke 20, verses 41 to 45, we read, while the Pharisees were assembled, Jesus questioned them, what do you think about um, the son of Christ? Whose son is he? David, they answered. Jesus said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and until I put your enemies under your feet. So if David calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? So should this be a debate? Because here yeah, we are, we can see, we can clearly see from then and even now, um, it is clear that from the genealogy point of view, um, Jesus was from the bloodline of David and he was born of a woman, which means the crucial factor in this whole equation is to understand and accept that he was human like us. Even though David was the most important king, he called him Lord because of the hierarchy. Now, in this equation, it then helps us to understand that death came into this world and it has a process and anyone born of a woman is going to die. So what is that process? You are created, you live and you die. Now, what creates then, what is the problem then? Sometimes it's denial. But here we can see that we have a benchmark. There's a good point of reference How then did the people in the Bible deal with loss? We've got few uh, scenarios where we read um, and we hear that they were crying, some were tearing clothes because their sons or daughters had died. But Today we are going to focus on Jesus and maybe the New Testament. Firstly, the disciples of John were very proactive, if I am to use today's words. In Mark 6, verse 29, after King Herod killed um, John the Baptist, 
and beheaded him because his daughter had requested for his head, obviously through her mother, and he had to be killed. But how did his disciples deal with his death? In Mark 6, verse 29, we read, On hearing of this, that is his death, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. Now, if we compare the same with the disciples of Jesus, they did not do that. This is a reaction of a close followers. They didn't do it. If we look at these two situations, one, one side proactively uh, worked on the matter and did what they were supposed to do, you would have expected the same with the 12 apostles because they've been with Jesus. But what we read is they went and they locked themselves uh, in a room to such a point that when uh, the woman came back from the tomb, they had to knock and they had to open the door and the story goes on. Now, but then something else happens. In John 19 verses 38 to 40, afterwards, Joseph of Armatia, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and he removed his body. We read in 39, something also that we need to contemplate on. Nicodemus, who was previous. Uh, who had previously came to Jesus at night, also brought a mixture of meal and aloes, about 70 pounds. So they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen clothes with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, the question is, if it wasn't for these two men, and obviously maybe it's not recorded, there might have been other people that uh, helped. Who could have buried Jesus? Because his disciples were nowhere to be found. And we also hear that the women were in the background. So how do we deal with the loss and especially the loss of a loved one. If we look at Jesus, he knew he was going to die. His approach was different. He called his disciples, he gathered them, and he prepared them by encouragement, by talking about death, even though it's something that we don't want to hear. So he encouraged them, he prepared them, and it was a good thing because they've got it in their minds when it happens, at least you kind of have an idea that this is real. I think the message that Christ was giving to his disciples is to show them that, look, you can't escape death. It's inevitable. You are going to die one day. But when this happens, this is how you need to behave. And I think this now 
calls for us to maybe look at things from this perspective. The good thing with us is we understand and we know the process of death. You are born, you live, and one day you will die. That's reality. Also, one or two other examples which we get, we, we can get in Acts 7, verses 59 and 60. This is when they were stoning Stephen because they of his beliefs or what he was preaching. And while they were stoning in verse 59, Stephen appealed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I want us to underline that last, those last three words. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. These echoes that um, comes with that statement. Jesus also said that. And the people, they laughed at him. They say, this person has been dead for three days. How can you say he's asleep? How can somebody sleep for three days? And for us, this should be a lesson. We know that with the hope that we have, we can only fall asleep. Also of importance is to deal with death spiritually. Prayer and belief, uh, believing in uh, the ideas and the thoughts that we share as and when we share them. If you think of death, the very word can trigger images of darkness, vision of men and women in black uh, grieving, and for some, fear. But God doesn't want us to live in fear nor defeat. He wants us to live and die with the confidence that comes from knowing we belong to the victorious risen king who defeated death when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. No one may be able to understand the pain of loss or loved ones, but God's word is able to bring peace if you allow it to speak to you. Whether death comes as a sudden shock or something we have been prepared for, a friend, a relative was sick for long and you saw the pain they went through, nothing can ease that pain like words filled with hope. Also, no matter what stage of grief you are in, God wants to walk alongside you. He wants to push you to move faster. Uh, he wants to push you to move faster or to move on. He will guide you and give you strength for each step. May we all learn in Philippians 1.21, we read to live is Christ and to die is gain. More than anything, the reality of death should point to incredible hope we have in Christ. Every heartache and struggle on earth should draw us closer to our savior center us deeper in his thoughts and motivate us to engage in transformative conversations 
with others. So we continue with what the Bible say about um, <clears throat> death or loss. It's easy to read modern definitions for words and situations in biblical context. This often occurs when someone thinks of death. To our way of thinking, death means the end of something and the complete termination of life. In scripture, however, death primarily means reverse of what happened on creation. And also we read from X, it is falling asleep. Now, so what is important We need to understand that death is not only the separation of the spirit, which is the power of God, which was given on creation, and the body, which is the soul. There is also spiritual death if we separate ourselves from God. It should just worry us. We should just be as concerned as we will be if somebody dies. Do not die alone. We read of life in Christ, so the relationship should be strengthened. In John 14, 17, There is a message that Jesus was trying or he conveyed to his disciples. And he said to them, and this is how we need to then look at things as we endeavor to deal with uh, the loss and especially of the loved ones. God will give you another, come, uh, another partner to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. This is now when Jesus was preparing his disciples. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you on that day. You will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. God never really intended us to die. Scripture tells us God designed humans to live, well, also debatable, eternally in deep relationship with him. He created the rest of the universe by mere command, speaking stars, he spoke the planets. It was just his word and everything happened. But when it came to man, God's involvement was intimate. We go back to that uh, creation because we, we, I think we need to always go back to the source. In Genesis um, 2 verse 7, it reads, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And we know that before that, there is a combination of the practical, the work itself, forming a man from the dust of the ground. And there was also a word similar to the rest of the other things that he did on creation. But then the book of Psalm 139, we read, he knit together our inmost being 
that he knows us fully and searches our death. This shows the full involvement of God in our creation. So what do we need to do? How do we deal with loss of a loved one? We must mourn with hope. So we are, the above verses say, when we lose a loved one, it may feel as part of ourselves that has been removed from us. We grieve for a lot of things. The moments we have had and aspirations that will never come to fruition. Though this pain is real and deep, if our loved ones belong to Jesus, our sorrow should be always clear that one day we will see them again. They will wake up from that sleep. But what of if this loved one did not belong or believe in Jesus or haven't gone through the process, meaning that they didn't do the process stated in the Bible, the things of understanding, uh, believing, and baptism, which symbols the death and resurrection of Christ and then living according to his will. What will be our angle of approach in dealing with that situation? Our consolation should then lie with us. And this is my opinion. Uh, our consolation should be our understanding and acceptance of death in that it is God's will. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14, we read, the death of Jesus is proof to all these things. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. And there is echoes from what Jesus said. There's echoes from what Stephen said. Acts also uh, confirms this in Acts 7, when Stephen fell asleep after being stoned. So it is a situation of bye for now. So obviously, when it comes to these things, Maybe it's easier said than done. There is a struggle in grief. And grief doesn't come and go in a well-orderly manner or measured time. It happens in waves. It comes and goes. We have experienced, um, um, well, some have experienced it. And they are verses of comfort, especially to everybody here online. Matthew 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wound. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and serves the Christ in spirit. Now, if we read these verses and we look at the position or the positioning of Christ or God, it's a good position to know and understand and comfort. And he says, Wherever there is two or three of you, um, I'm also there. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, O who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me. And now this is one of the most important elements that we need to do. We need to learn to understand. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now the last statement, we know of a yoke. When you put oxen on the yoke, or imagine yourself on the yoke, the thing is heavy itself, and there is labor involved. But here Jesus is giving us assurance that my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Coping with grief and loss. Whatever type of loss um, sorry, I just scroll down quickly. So whatever type of loss you have suffered, there is no right or wrong way to grieve. Grief is a natural response, and I extracted this from some from a research. Grief is a natural response to loss. It's the emotional suffering you feel when something or someone you love is taken away. Often the pain of loss can feel overwhelming. You may experience all kinds of difficult and unexpected emotions from shock or anger to disbelief, guilt and profound sadness. The pain of grief can also disrupt your physical health, making it difficult to function in the normal way we have always done. Once these are normal reactions to loss, and the more significant the loss, the more intense your grief will be. The disciples went into hiding after Jesus was killed. So coping with loss of someone you love is one of the biggest challenges. And grieving is usually associated with all this, which causes most intense type of grief. So I, I then looked at, I researched, there is a psychiatrist by the name of Elizabeth Ross, Kabla Ross. She introduced what became known as the five stages of grief. These stages of grief were based on her studies of the feelings of patients facing terminal illness. But many people have generalized them to other types of negative life changes and losses, such as the death of loved one or a breakup. So the five stages are denial. This can be happening to me. The second one is anger. Why is this happening to me? Who is to blame? Bargaining. Make this not happen and in return I will. And we give so many promises when it comes to bargaining. Depression. I'm too sad to do anything. Acceptance. I am at peace with what happened. Once reaction, uh, whilst reactions seem natural, not everyone who grieves goes through all of these stages. And that's okay. Contrary to popular belief, you do not have to go through each stage in order to heal. In fact, some people resolve their griefs without going through any of these stages. Now, Kibla herself never intended for these stages to be 
rigid framework that applies to everyone who mourns. In her last book, it is written, uh, that was written in 2004, she said of the five stages of grief, they were never meant to help tuck messy emotions into neat packages. They are responses to loss that many people have. But there is not a typical response to loss as there is no typical loss. Our grieving is as individual as our lives. And close. This morning we read, um, well, our daily reading, which I gave late. Uh, that's why maybe we didn't read some. We read of the psalm where Jesus quoted and uh, talking about uh, prophecies, messianic uh, prophecies. So with us as uh, students of the word, Jesus is our example. He knew the scripture. He showed us how important it is to correctly understand it and build our thinking from it. It is inspired. It is without error or fault in its teaching. Now, as we are about to him, to remember this perfect example, this perfect teacher, I think it's when it comes to grieving, there is a whole lot of uh, angles of approach that we can use. And there is vast material that we can get, and especially from the Bible as it has all the answers. Even though the disciples went into a hiding, the disciples had a point to prove. They continued with his legacy through the use of instruction and knowledge they had acquired. It doesn't mean it was a smooth ride for them, but they didn't let failure define them, but rather they used it as motivation to move forward. Amen.